I believe in and I value election integrity. How do you plead to the six counts of conspiracy to commit intentional interference with performance of election duties? If I knew then what I know now, I would have declined to represent Donald Trump in these post-election challenges. Guilty. It is your decision to waive these rights and enter into this guilty plea because you are in fact guilty. I look back on this whole experience with deep remorse. Yes. How do you plead to count 15 conspiracy to commit filing false documents in indictment number 23SC188947? Guilty. And I now take responsibility before this court and apologize to the people of Georgia. Thank you. Hi, and welcome back to Amicus. This is Slate's podcast about the law and the rule of law and the courts and the Supreme Court. And as you may have noticed, there's a lot of that going around. I am Daya Lithwick. I cover legal affairs for Slate. And if your head is spinning this week between the full court press taking place at the hands of Fonnie Willis in Georgia, Jack Smith in D.C., Tish James in Manhattan, as well as the flippings and the floppings of Sidney Powell and Kenneth Chesbro and Jenna Ellis and maybe even Mark Meadows, you are emphatically not alone. So on this show, we wanted to catch you up on what we call the law of Trump, the gag orders, the plea deals, the walls closing in, with maybe a sidebar on whether any of that stuff even matters. And to do that, we're joined today by one of our very favorite people at Slate, Jeremy Stahl, who has... (laughs) generously taking it upon himself to follow every zig and zag of the Donald Trump legal trials from the two impeachments to the testimony of Michael Cohen on Jeremy's heroic theory. I think that, well, somebody has to do this Um, later on in the show. Jeremy's going to stay on the line and slip behind the velvet rope with me for our Slate Plus members only after party. It's not actually really a party. It's a little bit more like going behind the scenes at one of our edit meetings as we try to figure out covering this ever expanding field of really, really important, meaningful legal news. It's a chance for our Slate Plus members to hear us thinking through the next few months and how we're going to keep up with this all. And if you're not a Slate Plus member, but you'd like to get access to behind the scenes conversations like the one we're going to have with Jeremy, and if you'd like access to special bonus episodes from shows like Slow Burn, and if you'd like to never, ever hit a paywall at Slate.com and listen to all of our podcasts ad free, Please go to slate.com slash amicus plus for more details. And as I often say to our Slate Plus members, thank you. Thank you for supporting the work we're doing at the magazine. I hope you know we could not do it without you. But first things first, with Jeremy Stahl. He is Slate's jurisprudence editor and a repository of all of the Trump law arcana that I have forgotten. Jeremy not only writes on these topics for Slate, not only edits Mark Stern and all of our jurisprudence freelance pieces, he is also covering some of these Trump lawsuits in person, our own correspondent on the law of Trump to help us differentiate between the smoke and the mirrors, the horse race and the stakes, and the just rock 'em sock 'em madness of these daily court cases that are only going to ramp up. So, Jeremy, welcome back to Amicus for what will be one. Welcome back to Amicus for what will be the first of many, many updates on Donald Trump and his horrible, terrible, really very bad days in the courts. Thank you, Dahlia. I'm really happy to be here. Jeremy, can you start by maybe drawing us? I know this is unfair, uh, but can you do a kind of quick and dirty map of the criminal cases, the civil cases, where they're happening, what the timeline is? What's set to go to trial? What's already in trial? What is going to go to trial long after you and I, Jeremy Stahl, are sitting in our rocking chairs on the front porch of the home for the aged legal correspondent? Um, Can you sort of just lay out the table for listeners who have some vague inchoate sense? There's a lot of stuff happening all at once, but they don't know what is what. I think the easiest way to wrap your head around this is to split it up between the the civil cases and the criminal cases. And it helps, too, because the civil cases are happening first. So right now in New York, 
you have uh, Tish James, New York State fraud prosecution of the Trump organization, which has been happening the past couple of weeks and particularly this week with fireworks between Trump's former attorney, Michael Cohen, and the former president himself, who's been in the courtroom. And there's been, you know, explosive outbursts and gag order, uh, disobeyals and fines and all sorts of drama. And that is a seriously threatening Trump's business empire. That's thing one. Uh, thing two, that is also a civil trial, is the second E. Jean Carroll defamation trial. She has already won a defamation suit against Trump, and Trump has already been uh, found liable in a second defamation suit for his comments about her and what a judge found him to be liable for defamation and rape um, in New York in the 90s. He's already been found liable in this second case. And that is going to trial in January. And this week you had uh, pellet arguments in front of a three-judge panel about whether or not Trump could claim at this late date that, well, he was immune from civil damages in this case because he made these comments when he was president and he has immunity. So those are the civil trials. I will move on to the criminal ones, which are, I think, the bigger threat and the more important cases for the purposes of our democracy and our institutions. I'll go first with Georgia because we were supposed to be in a trial already on this. Two of Trump's 18 alleged co-conspirators in Bonnie Willis's case in Fulton County, Georgia, over his alleged efforts to subvert the vote in that state, were supposed to be in trial this week. Uh, Kenneth Chesbro and Sidney Powell, as you mentioned. Last week, on eve of trial, both of them pled guilty. They accepted very generous deals and will agreed to cooperate against Trump going forward. What that means for the rest of the case itself is that that's the rocking chair case. That's the one that it's going to take months, if not years, for that to move ahead. But Fonnie Willis is slowly racking up these enormous wins in terms of getting people to plead guilty. We saw another one, as you mentioned, with Jenna Ellis this week. The next big one is the D.C., federal case in Judge Tanya Chutkin's courtroom. And that's the one where Trump is being prosecuted for efforts to overturn the election around January 6th and everything that surrounded that event. And that is due to to begin in March. The next one is the, (laughs) so many of these, I'm sorry, it's hard to just like crank through them all, but they're, I'm almost done, I promise. The third criminal case is the New York uh, state prosecution by Alvin Bragg, the New York district attorney, over the Stormy Daniels hush money payments. And that is also scheduled to take place in March, though the judge in that case has said, you know what, we're probably going to delay that. That's going to give way to the more important D.C. January 6th case. January 6th, more important than Stormy Daniels hush money. We'll probably have to back off that. Finally, there's the federal, also a case brought by Jack Smith, like the January 6th case, federal case in Southern District of Florida that looks at Trump's hoarding and collecting of classified documents in his Mar-a-Lago bathrooms. And that's due to begin in May. But Trump has asked a very favorable judge in that case, Judge Eileen Cannon, to delay it until after the election. And she's currently considering that request. So that's the map and the timeline. Amazing. And that's the one I actually really was thinking of, Jeremy, when I had us in the home for the aged uh, legal correspondent, because I just think uh, Eileen Cannon is going to let that thing play out as long as she possibly can, even though you and I can probably agree that as a kind of consequential national security matter, and given that we now know more, even than we knew then about loose lips uh, identifying ships, um, it seems like that's the one that it's unbelievably consequential and it may not happen in anyone's timeline soon. Well, he's allegedly talking to, you know, his Australian millionaire bestie about nuclear sub secrets or whatever and like what the U.S. nuclear arsenal looks like. And like, it's all a pattern of him holding on to these documents. And yes, you're absolutely right that the judge in that case, she has already like temporarily suspended some issues around discovery while she like 
takes up this claim by the Trump attorneys that the prosecutors haven't been forthcoming enough and quick enough with their discovery, which they, you know, refute and say is otherwise. But she's put things on pause while she considers this and this request to say, hey, let's do this after the election when maybe, you know, I might be a president elect and have an attorney general to appoint and be able to, uh, you know, say, let's not prosecute me anymore, please. But without the pleas, because it's Trump. Before we get to the meat of this conversation, which, as I think both you and I have now stipulated, just has so many spinning plates and moving parts, I want to ask you, because this is the air you breathe every day, and we're going to do this in the plus segment, but I just want to know if you have for your own purposes, developed some algorithm or mechanism for deciding what's a big deal, what's a small deal, what is a game changer, what seems important but kind of doesn't matter. It feels to me like this breathless, you know, media coverage of (gasps) Michael Cohen testified, (gasps) you know, the judge was told to stop rolling his eyes, (gasps) you know, Donald Trump was fined for running his truth social mouth again. Like everything seems cranked up to 11. And I'm just wondering, both as a writer and as an editor, how you are approaching the fire hose and how you decide for yourself. And it's totally fine, Jeremy, to say, I don't know, Dahlia. I just wake up in the morning and whatever bonks me on the head, um, I I edit that piece. But is there a way you think about what matters? I I have a lot of those cartoon bumps, like in various different places. They're they're constant every single morning, as you said. But like, I do feel like they've They've done the thing where, you know, Fred Flintstone sometimes get like extreme capabilities and wisdoms from from those bonks. And in terms of like (laughs) seeing what matters and clarity, the the constant stream almost almost helps a little bit. And and my feeling is that things that, you know, that are going to be, you know, uh, in and out of the news cycle in a day, Trump getting fined. OK, he, he got hit with a five thousand dollar fine last week. OK, he got hit with a ten thousand dollar fine this week, both over violating a gag order, preventing him from talking about court personnel in New York. OK, that's like high drama in a way. And, and he was forced to testify this week as well. That's also high drama in a way. But long term, does it really matter? On the other end, you have what's happened this past week in Georgia with Fonnie Willis's like game plan. Really, really, really coming into sight and just like the clarity and purpose with which she has pursued her Fulton County, Georgia case, where she charged Trump and 18 alleged co-conspirators, the clarity and purpose with which she is, she is taking direct aim at her goal. And she is using all the levers that a prosecutor has to reach that goal of, of bringing accountability to Donald Trump becomes very, very clear when you have some of the top people alleged to be co-conspirators in that case, aside from Rudy Giuliani, really. So you have Cindy Powell and Jenna Ellis, who worked very, very closely with Rudy Giuliani on all of this presentation of the big lie, the Stop the Seal campaign. And also, in Cindy Powell's case, is alleged to have been a key player in an, a just a bonkers December Oval Office meeting in which key elements of the attempt to subvert the election really came into focus, and including a pen, potentially appointing her special counsel, seizing voting machines, just crazy, crazy stuff. So she she's cooperating. She will be a witness against Donald Trump. That is a big deal. Same with Kenneth Chesbro, who orchestrated one of the key elements of the federal case against Donald Trump over January 6th is this fake elector scheme, the scheme to basically say, you know what, our people met in Georgia and they met in Pennsylvania and they met in Arizona and they met in Michigan and they met in Wisconsin. And these are the real electoral college votes, even though we lost all of those states, it was fraud and rigged. So, but here are the real ones. And that as an element of fraud perpetrated against the United States and as an effort to basically steal the election, the mastermind of this is Kenneth Chesbro, according to prosecutors, correct? And he immediately pled guilty as well. And each of these pleas then subsequently puts pressure on the next person to keep going and keep being the next witness when things finally come to a head and Trump is behind that defense table.
If I would have kept making only the minimum payments on my credit cards, my debt would have taken me 47 years to pay off. These are real National Debt Relief customers. I knew I wasn't going to be able to get out of debt by myself. Credit card, medical, or personal loan debt? National Debt Relief negotiates with your creditors to reduce what you owe. National Debt Relief got me out of debt. You could be debt-free in as little as 24 to 48 months. Visit nationaldebtrelief.com to learn more and get started. nationaldebtrelief.com. Hi, I'm Jennifer Palmieri. And I'm Claire McCaskill. We're the hosts of the MSNBC podcast, How to Win 2024. We both know firsthand that winning an election is hard. And having been in and around tough races for most of our adult lives, we have some unique insights into what it will take to win this 2024 election. And some crazy stories to share, too. Search for How to Win 2024 wherever you're listening and follow. New episodes every Thursday. So, so I think you've already quasi answered it, but I would love for you to spin it out just because you wrote such a, a good, good piece about last week about the Sidney Powell deal being a game changer. And I just want you to sort of color in for us essentially what you said when you wrote that piece, which is this is one of the architects and she now has to testify truthfully and if she doesn't she's in big honking trouble just give us a sense of what she is going to have to do and how that's going to affect Donald Trump so she received i think either 5 5 years or 6 years probation in Fulton County in Georgia and Part of her agreement is that she must testify truthfully in that case, which I said may take a while to happen. But at the same time, I've asked federal prosecutors about this. And what they say is that Jack Smith in his D.C. case, if he wants to use Sidney Powell as a witness in his D.C. case, he can now grant Sidney Powell immunity because she is still on the hook as an alleged co-conspirator in the federal case. She potentially faces the threat of indictment if she were to testify in that case. So she would plead the fifth in that case under normal circumstances. Now, though, she has this obligation to tell the truth in Georgia. She has the obligation to tell the truth in any court. And if she's presented with immunity, she will be forced to testify what she knows about this meeting in mid-December, immediately after which Trump tweeted about the January 6th rally. So it, it many, many, many components uh, happen around this meeting, and she was an integral player in it. And, and also, she has to testify about efforts to allegedly steal a voting machine in Coffee County, Georgia, and illegally acquire that data to prove this, like, bonkers theory about Venezuelan dictators stealing votes via Dominion voting machines, which she was, like, the chief purveyor of. Which brings another point, which it's. I don't want to exaggerate the importance specifically of Sidney Powell because prosecutors told me, you know, this person's a little bit, um, she said some wild, wild, more wild than anyone else stuff. And as a witness, I don't know how great she's going to be. I don't know how reliable she's going to be. But you know what? Now she's obligated to tell the truth for the first time. She's obligated to turn over documents for the first time. And she already gave a statement to Fonnie Willis. So Fonnie Willis knows what she has to say and deemed it worth a very favorable and generous plea deal, which who knows what that means, but it implies something. Can I just ask you the atmospheric question that you and I were talking about last week, which is these apologies are hilarious <laughs> when they have to apologize. And I know you and I were batting around like just the utter insanity of I think my joke was, um, I'm sorry I ate the voting machines <laughs> that were in the refrigerator. They were cold and delicious. <laughs> um, you know, it's just so, right, this is the William Carlos Williams joke I can't stop making. But can you just tell us, because it just seems so ineffably dumb that these people who tried to break democracy in addition to having to, you know, plead out and, and, and face these consequences <laughs> also have to apologize Dear Georgia, I'm sorry I tried to have your votes for lunch is perfect. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but like, you know, it's a pretty standard thing, I think, in criminal cases when a defendant pleads guilty and 
agrees to cooperate, they also will write an apology letter to the victims. And what Fonnie Willis says is the victims here were the voters of the state of Georgia. That's who this scheme targeted. It targeted national voters, but for the purpose of this case, it targeted Georgia voters. So like it makes a lot of sense and is kind of standard practice, but is also ridiculous because of the actual crime itself. And then you had Jenna Ellis, of course, who pled guilty this week, giving this near tearful apology um, declaration where she like, you know, sort of like, uh, I got misled by Rudy Giuliani, essentially, is what she said. She didn't name Rudy Giuliani, but she was like, I followed older attorneys who I thought were correct and they led me astray. And, you know, basically laying blame somewhere else. It's like, it's hard to take these people seriously, I guess, is one thing. But also it's, I like it. (laughs) It's good. It's accountability. Even if you don't think it's like super genuine or sincere, it is accountability. Right. It's the, it's the place where the Venn diagrams between LOL hilarious and actual meaningful democratic accountability overlaps. And it's just, I think you're right. It's just so hard to know how to think about it. I I, want to ask you this question because you kind of fainted it up top, but I really want to unpack it with you. When Fonnie Willis first brought this huge, sprawling, racketeering indictment, there was just a lot of complaining that it was too big, too much, too many people, too broad, you know, Jack Smith did this laser focused one, the one that you described, you know, playing out in front of Judge Chutkin in DC. And this, there's just too many people and there's, you know, un, unindicted co-conspirators. And it was just making people crazy. I feel like what you are saying, and I think I agree with you, is Fonnie Willis is doing a classic roll up, you know, racketeering. This is a mob trial. And it's working. And what do you sort of have to say about the fact that these two lawsuits are such polar opposites in some sense, uh, and they're both going to effectuate justice in different ways? But there was just a lot of of people talking smack when this first was unrolled. Well, we tried to make clear to readers, I think, early on that these are complementary efforts these these two um, cases are both basically about not the exact same thing, but very similar things, which was the effort to subvert the election, essentially steal the election after the, the 2020 vote was held. And what you have in each of them is in, in terms of surgical precision of Jack Smith, Jack, Jack Smith's target is Donald Trump was a threat to democracy. He is a threat to democracy. He needs to be held accountable quickly. If we pile on any number of these alleged co-conspirators, it will slow things down tremendously, even though it could eventually potentially yield uh, cooperating witnesses as part of a roll up. Then Fannie Willis comes in like a month later and says, you know what? We've got this. We've got all of the 18 alleged co-conspirator cooperators, not all of them, but like a freaking a lot of them, a good number of them, and we'll deal with them. Special Counsel Jack Smith, you can do your thing over there, specifically focused on Donald Trump, and we'll work on this part of the puzzle. And again, it's it's a hammer, and then on the other end, you'll have somewhat of a carrot coming from Jack Smith in terms of offering immunity deals and offering the potential for cooperation without necessarily threatening to throw people in prison for many, many years for these many, many, many alleged crimes. Let's turn to New York for a second, just because as high Shakespeare goes, this week is, I mean, we've got... As you said at the beginning, Michael Cohen, you know, Michael Cohen being called out as a liar. We have Alina Haba doing whatever it is that Alina Haba does. We've got uh, threats against the judge's clerk that is sanctioned. And then this just wackadoodle like, no, we weren't threatening her. We were threatening Michael Cohen. Like, there's so much (laughs) batshit going on. Is that the first time I've ever sworn on Amicus? Tell me 
two things. Uh, and you can amplify or talk about any part of that. But the two things I'm super focused on as we think on this show about, you know, again, stakes, not horse race. One, there is, I think, an argument that has been surfaced that this one really hurts Trump. And it hurts Trump because he is really shown to be a liar about the thing that matters, which is successful mogul, billionaire, you know, master of the universe. The other kind of related piece of this for me, and I think you and I have both written versions of this, Jeremy, is it just shrinks Trump down to like a little boy in the principal's office. He's just, you know, it's one thing when he's standing in the halls and and, and running his mouth, but when he's in that courtroom and he's just being pretty consistently bopped on the face with a, a rolled up newspaper, it just makes him small. So I wonder if you can talk about any part of the, that, that huge three-part question that you want to kind of dive into. But to me, I think it's it's not just theater. It's the courts working in a way that the courts don't get credit for. I think it's the courts working. I think it's hard to say how that actually plays uh, in the democratic space, in the electoral space, because there's no cameras of this. It's all secondhand reporting. There's no video of each individual time Judge Arthur Angaran goes, bop or boop, or whatever, I'm not in, the, in that courtroom, and I, like others, have to read about it secondhand. What it does, though, it clearly irritates him. It clearly gets under his skin in terms of this is the one that, you know, I think the criminal trials will be worse, but this is the one where he really, really feels it. And it, because it threatens his, it threatens his, not just his, like, global ego standing position, but also the business empire itself. Like there's money at stake for him. There's licensing agreements and the ability to have his name on Trump Tower and, you know, vast sums of money at stake. And he is acting out as one would expect of the, you know, misbehaving principal's office brat, but also he is being brought into line. And you saw that with the second fine over a second violation of a gag order in which the judge determined that he was, again, talking about the judge's clerk after being warned not to. And being warned not to and told specifically you cannot talk about court personnel, he went on the stand and he denied it. And normally he owns things like this. You know, he's the he's the guy, yes, I was talking about that person. He went on the stand and he denied that he was talking about court personnel. He said, I was talking about Michael Cohen when when I was making that statement about the person sitting next to you and the judge was like, not credible. I don't think you're a credible witness. Pay the court $10,000. You're fined. He sat back down. Later, he had another outburst moment uh, reportedly where he stormed out of the courtroom when the judge rejected a request for immediate dismissal of the case because of contradictions in Michael Cohen's testimony. And so he's not happy. He's certainly not happy. Right. So this is the Venn diagram where, like, it's not LOL overlapping with Democratic institutions holding. It's just straight up schadenfreude, right? Overlapping with, I mean, watching him suffer is, in some sense, its own reward. Yeah. I mean, if he did all the things that Tish James said he did, this is how the system should have been working all along. Yeah. Yeah. This is what should have happened many years ago. And in some ways, we might not be in this mess if... When New York District Attorney Cy Vance many, many years ago investigated things like this and said, no, pass, got, you know, like, I'm not going to do this. Like, if all of these allegations are true and a judge has already reached summary judgment to say one of them, one of the major ones is true, then, well, this is what should have been happening all along. So let's talk about the gag orders. You've brought them up a couple of times. This is, and I know I've written about it and you've written about it, and I know you've edited myriad pieces about it, but this is a sort of classic First Amendment nightmare where you're gagging the guy who is running for president and says this is pure First Amendment protected speech. And at the same time, he's terrorizing court personnel and witnesses and Jack Smith and the judges. Give me a sense of what the different 
gag orders and and Judge Chutkin has kind of pulled hers back. But can you give us a sense of how these judges are trying to walk that line, that First Amendment line, and maybe give us a sense also of whether a $5,000 fee, which I think is money that like you can sell the chandelier in the bathroom at Mar-a-Lago and come up with these fines, right? So does it matter? So as you've written before, and as others have written in, in Slate before, this is just the thorniest of the problems in terms of Trump being in these courtrooms and being held accountable by the legal system is he is incapable of shutting his mouth. He is incapable of not trying to intimidate those who he perceives as enemies, and in this case, witnesses or court personnel, as what, what happened in Judge Arthur Engeron's courtroom when he put a truth social post out making deranged allegations about a court clerk and continued to do so according to the judge in that case. Um, basically, he has to be stopped and he can't be stopped is the supposed bind, right? And I am a little bit more optimistic than that. And also at the same time, you have, I'll, before I get into my optimism, I'll say you also have very legitimate First Amendment questions about a candidate for president and somebody who says he needs to be able to mount a defense of himself in the court of public opinion as he runs for the presidency. And the ACLU this week specifically came out on Trump's behalf on that question and said the gag order in Judge Tanya Chutkin's courtroom was too vague, it was too broad, and Trump needs to be able to defend himself, which, okay. My optimistic version of that is that these can work. They can be narrow and they can work. You you can see in Judge Engeron's courtroom just how, again, small he looked when he was up there saying, no, but I meant Michael Cohen. He wants to go up to the line and test it as much as possible, but he doesn't want to be shown to be crossing the line. So his like whole deniability and plausible deniability around whether or not he violated that court order not to not talk about court personnel um, shows that he he can be boxed in here, I think. The other thing that shows that he can be boxed in here is that last week, Sidney Powell pled guilty on Thursday. Um, and then Kenneth Chesbro pled guilty on Friday. Over the weekend, Trump did not truth social post word one about either of those potential witnesses in his case. He did not say, because there was a gag order in effect. D.C. Judge Tanya Chutkin had her gag order in effect saying, you cannot target witnesses. And you know what? He didn't. He didn't say anything. On Monday or Tuesday, she lifted the order for an administrative stay while it pending consideration of the question of whether to stay at pending appeal. And immediately he started posting about Sidney Powell saying, I don't know her, basically. So like, I think that there is a world in which narrow, targeted efforts to protect the system of the courts and the system of justice that would happen in any other case to any other defendant can work for Donald Trump. And maybe that's going to be the most foolish thing I say on this podcast, and he's just going to just show how he can blow the whole thing up. Um, but the fact that he kind of was mute before this administrative stay of this gag order happened, I think sort of demonstrates the point a little bit. I mean, it raises questions for those of us who fear sort of generalized stochastic terror, right? That, you know, these are such incendiary posts, you know, much like the, you know, Mark Milley should be executed. These posts, in some sense, just create and foment generalized, you know, take up arms mayhem that is separate and apart from protecting court personnel. But I absolutely take your point that these judges are not responsible for stochastic terror. They're responsible for making sure that court employees and judges and prosecutors can get into their car in the parking lot. So I, I actually think your optimism is in some sense good to hear. I want to turn to Mark Meadows because that was, again, one of those things that was huge news and then kind of vaporized. But it seems to me 
that under your column of possible huge big deal, Mark Meadows' immunity news is possibly huge big deal and uh, big deal in terms of Meadows saying, no, I made it amply clear to him at the time he lost the freaking election. Game changer? So this is the thing that's been Mark Meadows is the chief of staff for Donald Trump in his last years in the Oval Office. And he was right there when everything around January 6th was happening and everything around the planning of trying to get members of Congress to go along with this plan to overturn the election. The phone call that Trump had with Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, where he solicited Raffensperger to find him exactly the number of votes he needed to win. Everything that was happening Meadows was involved in some way, correct? So to that point, this notion that he is a cooperating witness now and that he got an immunity deal, which, you know, for four weeks, to be fair, prosecutors and defense attorneys that I've spoken with have been like, this has to be what's going on backstage. This has to be what's going on behind the scenes. He's been so quiet and he's not a co-conspirator in this federal case. And yes, he was charged as a co-conspirator in Georgia, but Again, not in the federal case. The assumption has always been among a certain group of people that he has been cooperating. This ABC report sort of like confirms that assumption. And in that way, it's bad news for Donald Trump. And again, to go to um, the conversation we just had, Trump responded immediately by posting on Truth Social. Again, this was after the gag order was lifted, posting immediately on Truth Social that uh, he didn't think that Mark Meadows would basically betray him. And he said something about cowards. Only weaklings and cowards that are bad for the future of our failing nation would do something like this, would would cooperate with a prosecution of Trump. And he didn't think Meadows was one of those guys. So this is a very like clear effort at witness intimidation, if ever there was one. And it was um, used by Jack Smith in his request for Judge Shutton to lift her administrative say. So to return back to the question of Meadows, though, yes, it matters. And also, yes, we sort of knew this already. And the other problem with Mark Meadows' testimony that I'll say is that he's like notoriously this people pleaser who will tell anyone exactly what they want to hear. So he'll tell Attorney General Bill Barr that, yeah, I know the election wasn't stolen. We're working on trying to come to some peaceful transfer of power. And then he'll tell uh, Trump, you know, the election was definitely stolen and I'm working on it or whatever. This is according to reports, at least, of of the way that he operated at that time and the way he operates generally. So, like, there are going to be a lot of contradictions in what he said and what he may testify to. And there, those contradictions are already emerging between what he reportedly told the grand jury and what was in his book. So it's it's complicated. On this week's On the Media, we investigate the man behind the conservative takeover of the courts. Spoiler alert, this is about way more than the U.S. Supreme Court. The rights revolution in the United States didn't happen just because you magically got five justices on the court who agreed with you. On this week's On the Media from WNYC. Find On the Media wherever you get your podcasts. On February 4th, 1933, Huey Long invented a holiday to prevent a bank from collapsing. In December 1960, three years before he was assassinated, JFK was almost killed by someone using a homemade bomb. And in 2014, remember this, there was a whole news cycle about the fact that President Obama wore a tan suit. Our history is full of all sorts of forgotten stories, but ones that can teach us a lot about how we got to this very strange moment we're living in right now. My name is Jody Abergan, host of This Day in Esoteric Political History. Me, two historians, countless stories that will stick with you. This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. Find it wherever you listen to podcasts. Jeremy, you just posted, I think, a really smart piece on essentially laying out these are Trump's top four main defenses in the criminal cases, and here's why they're garbage. Can you just walk us through them? Because I think it's just such a good synthesis of 
the emerging defense strategy that we all, some of this we knew was coming, some of this I, I don't think we could have imagined, but can you just sort of walk us through the four? Absolutely. So uh, to, to make clear up front what this is from, this is from Trump has offered four motions to dismiss the January 6th prosecution in Washington, D.C. So he's asking Judge Shotkin, throw the case out. I have four specific reasons why. And this week he filed three of them. And in, in those three, he made about four new arguments about why that case needs to be thrown out, why he's in essence innocence. And this, I think to your point and to the point that I tried to make in the piece, sort of serves as a preview of what a defense might look like if and when this case goes to trial. So, (laughs) and just, I spoke with a number of prosecutors about these motions and they're all just like, this is such junk. And this is some, uh, Frank Bowman, who is a former federal prosecutor and really like one of the top experts on impeachment in the country, uh, told me uh, all this stuff is so bad that from a legal perspective, it comes close to being sanctionable by the court. And let me walk you through why, because it truly, you don't have to have a legal degree to see how just terrible these arguments are. The first one is essentially Trump, when he was advocating for the election to be overturned, he was simply advocating a, and this is the part of this is where he might have the strongest case, but part of it is just so bad. He says the First Amendment protects him and that he was just using his First Amendment free speech protected rights to advocate for his position that the election was stolen and to, to preserve the election, right? But in making that case, his attorneys also say that the claims that the election was rigged or stolen or that fraud or regulars tainted the outcome in certain states constitutes core political speech that is not readily verifiable or falsifiable. The federal government may not dictate whether such claims are true or false. So their argument is essentially, you know what, who's to say? Dozens and dozens of court threw out our claims. There's been no evidence put forward that there was fraud that tainted the election. But who's to say? It's essentially an argument that there is no truth, right? And that is at the core of his First Amendment argument, initially at least. The second argument he made in one of these motions is that Joe Biden is going after him. It's a witch hunt. This is selective prosecution. And the problem for him there, which uh, another really smart attorney and leader in this space and former President Obama's ethics czar, Norm Eisen, told me, was that this claim that he's being selectively prosecuted has an incredibly high legal bar to meet. So he has to prove that other people who were similarly situated could have been prosecuted were but we're not, which is like nobody else is similarly situated because nobody else has done anything like this. Second, he has to prove that the government's selection of him for prosecution was motivated by insidious intent. And he's got no evidence of that. He throws out a couple of news articles that showed that President Biden behind the scenes was frustrated with Merrick Garland for being slow on these cases. But those articles always explicitly say Biden has never had any direct communication with Garland over this. So he's not pulling the levers behind the scenes. And you know what? It's just a weak and hard case to make. I'll quickly run through these last two. The the other one that I've really been just so frustrated by is this claim that he was impeached already and acquitted in the Senate over January 6th. So therefore, no do-overs, double jeopardy. And what that ignores, according to Bowman, this impeachment expert, is that impeachment is not a criminal proceeding. There's no double jeopardy here because Trump was never on the hook criminally. This is the first time that's happening. What it also ignores is that during his impeachment, he specifically argued that the correct venue for trying this matter was the criminal courts and not impeachment. So he wants to have his cake and eat it too. Finally, uh, it's there's statutory claims around whether or not the charge in D.C. conspiracy to defraud the United States can be held up because he claims that his efforts to get election officials to overturn the vote did not involve, quote unquote, deceit or trickery. So he was just like being, you know, straightforward with people. And like, he wasn't like strong arming anybody or tricking anybody. He was just like expressing an opinion, man. (laughs) I like that you just stopped there. I thought there was more to say, but you're just like, that's, I I got, I got no glass on that because it's insane. Um, Before we say goodbye, we could talk about this for hours, but I do want to pan back, uh, particularly in light of the 
pretty clarion warning we got from Ian Basson from Protect Democracy in last week's show. Um, and, and the suggestion uh, in a piece from The New York Times this week that Team Trump is actually 100 percent on message right now. They are focused. Uh, and the message is this presidential campaign. It's not uh, the, you know, these court cases. And, you know, what Ian said last week is that the House Speaker's race was a kind of template for MAGA gone wild, uh, sane Republicans being threatened and sidelined. You can keep losing in the courts and win in politics. And that certainly feels like the vibe based on the House Speaker's race that was resolved earlier in the week. This is not a new conversation, Jeremy. You and I have had this conversation since 2016. But what do we do about the fact that standing out there in the hallway in the court of public opinion and not diminished by gag orders or judges booping him on the nose, Donald Trump and the MAGA wing of the Republican Party are still ascended? So since we've been having this conversation since 2015, 2016, I've been making bad predictions about this. So I'm going to like try to steer clear of the electoral prognostication and saying what this means for the vote itself, right? Um, and unfortunately, that is like that is where this problem needs to be solved. Ultimately, is through democracy. And you know, we thought Joe Biden had done it in 2020, but that turns out, you know, there's a return, and. What I will say, though, is that you are absolutely correct about the ascendancy and the return, and you are also absolutely correct that this speaker's race, as Ian and you discussed on a little bit more optimistic notes when things looked a little bit better last week than they did do now, is definitely uh, you know a signal about where where all this is headed. Mike Johnson, he's seen as sort of a backbencher, but he has had these like small, not serious leadership roles. He's the new speaker of the House. From what I have seen uh, watching many, many, many House Judiciary Committee hearing, he is a quiet, boring Jim Jordan. So all the same views as Jim Jordan, the same extremism as Jim Jordan. But I think one member of the Judiciary Committee, when, when he commented, I can't remember if it was Jamie Raskin or somebody else, said he's polite. He's got all the MAGA, he's got all the Jim Jordan aspects, but he's polite. And it's true. He's very. He presents very much nicer and cleaned up than some of the others, the Matt Gateses and the Marjorie Taylor Greens and the Jim Jordans and the Lauren Boberts. Um, but he is pretty close to their camp, if not entirely in their camp. So that's that's bad news. And we'll see how that plays out. That's going to come to a head quite significantly over the next month because there has to be appropriations to fund a government. And we'll see whether that happens and how that happens, or if there's a shutdown. We'll know very quickly how bad this is, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, I might add one, because <laughs> I can't be me unless I go one lower than you emotionally. But I think that <laughs> I'm also really struck by the fact that it's not just MAGA, it's MAGA in the form of, I mean, put aside the religious, you know, conviction, put aside, you know, this is a biblical republic. It's MAGA with a veneer of constitutional lawyering. And what scares me is unlike, you know, Jim Jordan, unlike Matt Gates, this is the Josh Hawley, Mike Lee school of... No, there is no wall between church and state. Uh, I can tell you that as a deep constitutional thinker. And I think it's a fitting maybe end to a conversation about the law and the Constitution, that this is a person who comes cloaked in a completely false but utterly credible claim that he is an expert on constitutional law. So I just think from the perspective of where I sit, uh, the danger is not just that he's Jim Jordan with a better haircut. It's that he's Jim Jordan who purports to know what the Constitution means and has no fear about distorting it to achieve the ends he wants. And listeners, you should see Jeremy Stahl's face on the Zoom right now. <laughs> I may... <laughs> I. I am utterly horrified because you're absolutely right. And I'll just tack on to that to come around full circle to, to, to the core of what we've been talking about this entire time is on that playing field. He is reported to have been the 
chief architect uh, for the sort of like sane congressman's case to vote to not certify the 2020 presidential election. And what he said, which I heard from a lot of other like sane to sensible sounding Republicans I was talking to while reporting at the time, that the case that he made was, well, because of the pen and it, it doesn't work for a number of reasons. Specifically, you can't litigate these things after the fact once you haven't done it initially. But the case that he made was, well, it was a pandemic and Wisconsin changed its voting rules and Michigan changed its voting rules and all these places changed their vote. Pennsylvania changed their voting rules and it was unfair that they changed their voting rules. So the House of Representatives has to decide now because what they did was not cool, even though it wasn't challenged and they didn't win on those grounds at the time. They were doing a takesy backsy. He's the one who came up with that as a legal campaign, as a legal strategy, as a veneer of plausibility legally, not, you know, Dominion voting uh, ghosts of Hugo Chavez ate our, ate our ballots. But like they shouldn't have done that and we should get to decide. That is now the person in charge of the House of Representatives. So there's my I, I went up to you on the anti cheeriness. I did it. You did it. The serious lawyers have entered the chat. Jeremy Stahl is Slate's jurisprudence editor. He is somehow the unfortunate repository at the magazine of all Trump law arcana. And he writes on this for Slate. He edits Mark Stern. He edits me. Um, He edits all of our freelance jurisprudence pieces. And he's been covering uh, the deep, deep granular detail of these Trump lawsuits. So some of us don't have to do it every day. Jeremy, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. This was incredibly useful. And uh, we'll talk more in Slate Plus, but we will just keep you on speed dial in the coming months. Thank you. Thank you, Dahlia. And that is a wrap for this episode of Amicus. We're calling it the Kraken Venn Diagram Edition. Thank you so much for listening in. And thank you so much for your letters and your questions. You can always keep in touch at amicus at slate.com. And you can find us at facebook.com slash amicus podcast. Thank you, as ever, for your thoughts and feedback. Today's show was produced by Sarah Burningham. Alicia Montgomery is vice president of audio at Slate. And Ben Richmond is our senior director of operations. We'll be back with another episode of Amicus next weekend. And until then, take good care. On this week's On the Media, we investigate the man behind the conservative takeover of the courts. Spoiler alert, this is about way more than the U.S. Supreme Court. The rights revolution in the United States didn't happen just because you magically got five justices on the court who agreed with you. On this week's On the Media from WNYC. Find On the Media wherever you get your podcasts. On February 4th, 1933, Huey Long invented a holiday to prevent a bank from collapsing. In December 1960, three years before he was assassinated, JFK was almost killed by someone using a homemade bomb. And in 2014, remember this, there was a whole news cycle about the fact that President Obama wore a tan suit. Our history is full of all sorts of forgotten stories, but ones that can teach us a lot about how we got to this very strange moment we're living in right now. My name is Jody Abergan, host of This Day in Esoteric Political History. Me, two historians, countless stories that will stick with you. This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. Find it wherever you listen to podcasts.